Trouble sometimes I hear feeling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear now is that stay. Seek the way pilgrims strive, Christians away. My Jesus is Jesus coming soon, morning or night. Thanks for sharing your time with us today. We're going to have a special guest. It's his first time here. His name is Steve Core. Steve, glad to have you here. Glad to be here. Now, Thanks. let me get this straight. You are with the uh, what International Institute for Restorative Practices. Oh, you, Did I say that you, right? You said it right. You That's said it right. right. We've yeah. got that done. So, okay. <laughs> We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But first, when people look on the set and they're still watching television and they've seen me and... and and they say, you, how tall are you? Uh, <laughs> I'm not so sure that that really comes across when I'm sitting it's in a chair. Uh, but go yeah, but I, I'm 6'9". 6'9". Yeah, and that really, uh, that really helped in my days when I was up. playing basketball and, and all of that. But uh, Where'd you play? I played at Shippensburg University. Um, it's one of the state schools in Pennsylvania. And uh, a, a good number of years ago, I did that. Uh, but I uh, was blessed enough to be able to, uh, did to you get a full school? scholarship. I there. guess you did play uh, in high school. Absolutely played in high school and high school and college. And uh, What was the change? Uh, we'll get into this, sure. uh, what you came here to talk about. Oh, that's, no, that's great. <laughs> what about the change from the high school to the college game? Um, I actually w was told in high school a good bit about that, you know, to be prepared for that, that it's a different game. And uh, I was humble enough to listen, but I really had no idea. And uh, not that I was the superstar by any stretch of the imagination in high school, uh, but just kind of my natural ability. Wasn't super, I'm a lot heavier now than what I was then. Uh, well, it kind of made me one of the, you know, one of the better players. Uh, but when I got to college, everybody, <laughs> everybody's as good I've as me. Heard from, I've yeah. heard from other guys. Yeah, and, and so I really, uh, really had to uh, step up the game and, uh, and also the pace of the game. It was a lot faster. It was a lot faster. One of the things that I, I followed, uh, one, particularly one person in high school here in, in Nashville, okay. and he went and played at Vanderbilt. Okay. And uh, just watching him and, and watching them when the game's over, they come out of the dressing room, come out and meet family and friends that's there mm -hmm. and so forth and mm -hmm. so on. And the thing that struck me in high school, it was a very close-knit team, you know, with everybody was bonded together pretty much. Sure. By the time he got to college level, a lot of competition. Yeah. And it was more of individual in my game. They still played as a team. Sure. And did as a team would do. But a lot, uh, I just sort of felt like they were felt alone a little bit, left out when they got into all that level of competition. I can't imagine how it is when they go on the pros. Oh, I, I mean, I, that's got to be something that's, that's, really, uh, that's really hard to deal with. Um, that was actually one of the things that um, I had a little bit of, uh, of an opportunity to maybe do some things overseas. And, and that really was one of the main things that people talked about uh, in overseas ball at the time. It's, it's changed since then, but it was just really a lot of people who were out trying to make themselves look the best and so they can, you know, make it to the show and come back and be in the NBA or whatever it was. And just a lot of, uh, you know, not, not as much you of know, a teen's comp concept. I had the privilege one time to have lunch with Charles Davis, who played with the Chicago Bulls when Jordan was there. Okay. And he went on and played at Milwaukee and he, to and he played overseas too. And he told me he enjoyed overseas actually more. I mean, really, you know, he's probably played in the NBA. Sure. But he said he really enjoyed playing overseas, which surprised me. Sure. But he said he really enjoyed. He loved the travel. Okay. And, and so forth, and loved it. Well, if you have what brings you to Music it? City? <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'm actually here uh, providing a four-day. Uh, professional development of, around restorative practices and report. what is restorative practices break it down i'm a layman help me understand uh, okay. what this is all right well we're, the uh, the metro human relations commission has, has brought us down and wanting to uh, uh, do some connect working with uh, you know with uh, organizations around nashville helping people get connected so th that's uh, part of what brought us here but the restorative practices is actually a um, it's it's a graduate school located in uh, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, the, the International Institute for Restorative Practices, and um, our, our fundamental this is like a university. Uh, graduate school? Yeah, what it's, do you it's, mean? A, it's a graduate school. Uh, could you, okay, we're going to go here now. Yeah, All right, right. this is good. Yeah, you and talk to me. It's a, uh, a freestanding um, graduate school, so we are not connected to an undergraduate. Okay. And that in and of itself is quite a challenge, but we could are fully I accredited. go to it? Uh, if you're eligible for graduate studies, absolutely. I'm not eligible. Could. Okay. <laughs> so you got you got to have a so I got to have a bachelor's. All I get to do is you know, okay. You got to have a bachelor's. Got to have a bachelor's me. degree that's, because that's it is it is a fully accredited graduate school, 
and um, we've had five graduating classes now, so we're relatively new. In the new field of restorative practices, and the fundamental hypothesis of restorative practices is that human beings are happier, uh, more cooperative, and more productive, and more likely to make positive changes in their behavior when those in positions of authority uh, do things with them in an engaging, collaborative way, as opposed to doing things to them in a punitive uh, sort of a way, or doing things for them in a permissive kind of a way, or perhaps uh, not doing anything at all in an you're talking in about Nissan, talking about Nissan, Nissan practices like the like the uh, Japanese uh, practice in their automobile making. Is well, that is that a parallel? I, uh, I, it might be, but I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> <about that. laughs> no, about those practices, but. Um, their leadership's involved with their, yeah. from what I've been told, in their in their auto plants. Okay. Their leadership is very involved, in along the, beside the employees. In, so yeah. I've never worked there. I've just seen movies on uh, movies. Yeah. So um, perhaps being uh, in, to take that example as far as I can possibly take it, um, you know, being in uh, the you know in the. the the industry and then where they're building or whatever it is and working alongside is certainly could be perceived as as one way of being restorative um, but uh, you know we talk about exercising your leadership and how you exercise your authority and a part of being in the position of leadership and authority is casting vision making decisions uh, you know putting policies or procedures in place and having people uh, you know follow through with that so how do you go about doing it so you can just say you are going to do this because I said it and that's the two strategy which many people are very familiar with or you can say oh don't worry about it you're not producing high enough but you know it's it's a tough job and and let me just finish it for you and do things for people which is permissive and ultimately a disrespectful way to people mm -hmm. to treat people mm -hmm. You can just say, you know what, I'm not even going to try to engage at all. I'm just, you know, do whatever you want, and that's neglectful. What we say with restorative practices is to hold people to high standards of behavior. If you're being treated in a restorative way, you're under pressure to perform at a high level. But you have all the support and the, that you need to be able to achieve that. So it's not just you're going to do this because I said so. You say, we are going to achieve at this level because it's what is best for all of us. It's what creates the best product or whatever it is. So let's sit down and talk. What do you need? What are your goals? How do you work best? How do we support you? What are the areas of strength where you can run? And where do we need to really be there to make sure you, you have the support that you need? I have a question. Sure. Is this done one-on-one -on -one or is this group dynamics? Or yeah. both? Or yes, yes, it is absolutely both. It is absolutely, absolutely both. both. Okay. And so, and that's why, um, that's why we talk about, uh, in many ways, restorative practices being a leadership model. And All so, right. how is question. it? Sure. I, I'm chasing rabbits here. Okay. I do no. a lot of chasing rabbits. <laughs> okay, that's you fine. You may have come back to Nashville. <laughs> we may have to I was, I, I, I just got out of high school. Barely. If I'd gone to another school, I wouldn't have got out. I have learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of disabilities. A lot of things. Plus, I'm slow to start with. But <laughs> we won't go into all that. I was uh, blessed to go to a middle school here in Nashville a few weeks ago. School was starting. And it's orientation, grandparents' day, so I'm there. Mm -hmm. And the teachers made a beautiful presentation mm -hmm. uh, here in Nashville. And, and, and they talked about, we are about teaching the process and I don't know whether I'm in the same ball game with you here or not. We are teaching the process, not the right answer. Gotcha. We're trying to teach you to get to the right answer, and you will. We feel like the student will get to the right answer. I hope I'm, uh, 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 hope I'm communicating what she said the way sure. I stood it. I sure. hope I heard what I thought I heard. <laughs> but she said, "What's so important? Our children need to know the process. Mm -hmm. If they know the process, they will get to the right answer." Mm -hmm. And I, bingo, the light went on for me. That would have worked for me right. if I could study the process instead mm -hmm. of having to just get the right answer. Yeah. Anyway, you go get it, you yeah. just get the right answer. Right. Uh, and then I saw a special on television. Juan Williams, Fox News, did a special on some education uh, schools that were very successful. And they were talking about uh, out in Arizona. He did, there's all over the United States, some in New York. And children are just knocking it out. Okay. They are really doing good. And there, it sounds like what you're talking about is the way they're teaching these children. Does this? Do you are you familiar with any of this I'm talking about? Or uh, in a general way, I, d I definitely feel as okay. though you know um, I can speak uh, to some of that. 
Um, one of the, the challenges, um, as I, I travel across the country, I provide professional development for educators uh, around how to build community and connection in the classroom. Human beings change their behavior based upon the bonds that they form with one another, and we create bonds through the mutual sharing of experiences, hopes, fears, um, right answers, wrong answers, how we came about things, just sharing things with, with one another. Relationships. And, and, we, and we build that and strengthen that by sharing and communicating with one another. So what does that look like in the classroom? And so um, we travel around and do this restorative practices work uh, with educators uh, around the country. And we're actually around the world. We have five offices around the world. We're in 17 different countries at this time. But this, this whole notion of uh, there's high stakes testing in education, which is very real and very much of a challenge. Um, and a lot of funding for schools is tied to how well they do mm -hmm. on these high stakes tests. And so if you're forced in that type of a dynamic, it just it makes sense, teach to the test. The people that are doing well, give them skills so they can do even better. And the people that are struggling, well, there's all kinds of ways that, that, that people handle that. That's part of the reason for No Child Left Behind and all of that. So we can kind of, you know, people of an education has kind of at times slipped into this teaching to the test, and there's there's some there's some pushback against that, and I believe that it's uh, rightly so, and so people are talking about, um, you know, teaching about learning and thinking about thinking, and so how do you go about being successful, and how do how do you uh, understand the process to be able to get to the to the correct outcome, and that's that's a critical part. Restorative practices would, um, I, don't want to, I don't know, take it to another, another level or look at it from a little bit of a, of a different perspective. So if we're going to focus on, in a classroom, with students, individually, in groups, focus on how they get to certain answers, what their needs are, whatever, how do we create the environment to every move from day point a to, B. to move from point A to point B? How do we create an environment where people feel safe enough to really talk about what their struggles, to really raise their hand and say, I didn't get the homework last night, uh, and that to be okay, and not to be afraid of ridicule or to be bullied or, or whatever else might come with it, not to be have a teacher slam their hand in, in exasperation and say, how many times can I, you know, just to honestly be able to say, here's where I'm at, and, you know, here's my strengths, here's my weaknesses, how yeah, many can I grow and develop? My whole goal in school with my learning disabilities mm -hmm. was to not let anybody else. And that's Absolutely. just today. I am 68 years old. Mm -hmm. I can walk in a room, or uh, being a minister, I walk in a Bible class. Subconsciously, when I walk in, the first thing that's on my mind yep. is don't let anybody in this room know how dumb I really am. Yeah. I went through high school with that's my number one mission. If when I walked out of class, if I was able to disguise my disabilities in my ignorance, and I thought, I didn't know about disabilities, I mm -hmm. thought it was stupid, mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. then I had accomplished my mission yeah. that day. I would use diversion, I'd do everything I could, uh, whatever, the necessity to survive, Sure. control the room, I, I'd go to other people and do it, trick other people into doing things, <laughs> they'd get in trouble, sure. anything to keep them from calling on me because I couldn't yep. read. Yep. And so, never learned to read, big struggle. So. What you're talking about is they would, if I were a student in your setting, you would be training people to get me to be comfortable where I could say, I can't read. Yeah. And it is not solely just the teacher in the room who's going to um, you know, have, a, have a relationship with you and talk with you and try to understand you know, what's going on. It is also creating um, an environment in the classroom where other students would have not just a, a sense of responsibility just solely for themselves, um, but also, you know, this is my community, this is my class, how do I, how do I help my classmates achieve? So to be kind of uh, specific there, one of the things we encourage teachers to do um, in their classroom is to use circles. Okay, where uh, you know, oftentimes traditionally in, in classrooms, the, the, the desks are set up in rows and everybody's facing the front, and the teacher's desk is usually up front. Sometimes teachers put their desks in the back so they can see kids from the back and catch them doing things wrong. Uh, well, we would say, um, you know, when possible, to, to put students in circles, perhaps teach in the circle or just, you know, for, for a few moments, a few minutes, just have a student sit in a circle and talk about uh, what's going on. So, for example, we do something called a check-in and a check-out. Monday morning, we might come in, sit in a circle, and you have two tests, and everybody answers and goes around in a circle. What's one highlight from your weekend? Good. Everybody talks about it. 
what's one goal you have for yourself for the week? And everybody talks about it. Check out Friday afternoon, let's say, before you leave. How did you do with your goal? Everybody shares that. And if you achieved it, they celebrate it some way. If you didn't achieve it, the question then becomes from your peers, from your students, how can we help you achieve your goal next week? And then begin to have these dialogues and begin to have these interactions. That is so another. healthy. And another thing that we have them do is at the beginning of the year, sit in a circle, do a go-around where everybody says, what does the ideal classroom look like? And instead of the, the, you know, the staff up front and lecturing and teaching, just simply ask the kids. Same thing we do in, in organizations, the same kind of work that we do in community when we, you know, just working with families or whatever it is. What is the ideal, whatever, ideal fill in the blank look like? And give people an opportunity to talk about it. Then we follow that up with what behaviors get in the way of achieving that ideal? And people talk about that and begin to share. And you know how many people were feeling um, how many people do feel and how many people were feeling. I don't want people to think that I'm not capable. I don't want people to view me as incompetent. You know how many people in that classroom when you were growing up were probably feeling that way? No Pro idea. Probably 100%. Really? Probably 100%. And there may be even people that did well academically. Might, you know, maybe in math class they feel competent, but mm -hmm. maybe in other areas, maybe socially, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, they, they, they're whatever. They don't like their voice. They don't like their face. They don't like their ears. I don't yeah, know. Particularly, yeah. so young yeah. people's got something wrong with them. They think something's wrong that, with them. That's right. Wrong that's with right. Them. And yeah. if they could just understand that they're not alone in that. Okay. Extremely healthy. Yeah, uh, extremely to be able to talk about that. So what does ideal look like? excuse me, what uh, would get in the way of the ideal, and what commitments do we make to ourselves and to each other to help us achieve the ideal? Now, and, uh, once you achieve that, once you get into your training, and I may be way off base asking this question here, but uh, once you're teaching teachers <coughs> and so forth, is there a point in your uh, <coughs> institution, or, or what do you call yourself, restorative practices? <laughs> restorative practices. Do, uh, do you pull <coughs> parents in? <coughs> One of the things we, again, we go back to human beings change their behavior based upon the bonds that they have. And who are the most significant bonds that they have in their lives? Hopefully parents or maybe it's a coach or maybe somebody from, you know, from the church that yeah. they belong in, whatever. And particularly for students that are struggling. So maybe they're not connected to the class. Maybe they're not connected to the teacher. Um, who are they connected to? One of the things we encourage people and a lot of this does go back to classroom management and you know uh, problems that are that are happening in classes and, and how to help uh, teachers deal with that. So one of the questions we ask when you're looking at a young person who maybe you're even real frustrated with. I mean, it's hard. How right, many times can right. you get the I'm not going to do yeah, this and yeah, the attitude yeah, yeah. and the blank this and the blank that? And um, you know, so we that we would all the yeah all those defenses. Survival. We would mm -hmm. we would say um, just kind of ask yourself the question: There's somebody in this young person's life that they don't treat this way. Who is it that grandma. they don't treat this way? Grandma or, or grandma. Oh, that's right, or, or, or a coach or, mm -hmm. you know, the guy, the guy who runs the corner store down the right. street who right. gives you, you know, you know, a little sandwich every day or something. There's somebody in this person's life that they don't treat that way. Who is that? And do everything you can to get them to the table in some fashion. Be it physically at the table, <clears throat> be it through, you know, calling them or, or whatever it is. Because in the presence of that other person, that student is going to, their behavior is going to be more appropriate. They're going to, they're going to function with more decorum. And so th in that spirit then, how do we start to have a conversation around what's going to be best to support this, this student? So if I have graduated from my uh, bachelor's work for your school mm -hmm. and I'm watching this show yeah. and I think, ooh, I, would, I could enroll in your school yes. and that would qualify me significantly to go to work for one of the education uh, communities, uh, cities go into the field of education? Um, it, would, it would help you, absolutely. At this point, and I, I want to be answer that question like very technically, qualify me significantly. Um, I believe someday we would be able to say that. We're not at that point right now. And the reason why I say that is, um, you know, we've been a grad, we've had five graduating classes. Restorative practices is a new and growing field. Part of our mission is to uh, support research and uh, to conduct research that's going to help strengthen that. Um, but we're still in the, in the beginning phases of that. And so we are just now uh, at the point where we see um, in, in some areas, uh, I, I mean, I know of just a few, a handful right now, of 
you know, restorative pr knowledge of restorative practices, a, you know, a, a plus or, or, or a benefit. Um, we have some people who have said, you know, I became a principal and what really separated me from my, you know, my competitor who else was going for the job was my knowledge and my vision around using restorative practices in a school. And so it's at the point now where people are looking for educators who understand uh, the philosophy of you know, bringing people together, developing bonds and connections, knowing how to do that and, and have that inform their daily practice. And, but as we continue to grow, I think this, just the credential itself, which, at, which is a master's of science in restorative practices in okay. education, in youth counseling, or in a, a concentration of, of your own of your own making. So, we, masters of restorative practices in the church, or in in community building, in coaching, in elder care, where you can have your you make a case for your your own focus, and then working with uh, the professors at the at the graduate school to um, to weave that into your education. And so, you would just have a masters of restorative practices. But, how long um, is that? How long does it take you to start to finish the? Uh, the school. I mean. Thirty credits, uh, and you typically about two years. Two years. If you go full time. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What should I ask you that I haven't asked you? Because we ain't got about eight minutes to go. Are you? Oh, really? Uh, wow, wow, wow. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the fourth quarter. Uh, we're in the fourth quarter here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, what do you want people to know? What I want people to know, um, what, you know, when it comes to uh, this work with restorative practices, um, a couple of things. In a real general way, um, there is hope. Um, so many people um, in various settings, well, in good. different organizations, and think, oh, there's, there's, oh, it's just done, and people aren't going to care about each other, and these kids are just so violent, and they, and they, they, they don't, they don't care about human life, and all of those types of things. And uh, we would absolutely say. Yeah, that hasn't been our experience at all. Good. And uh, you know, we would like to kind of buy into the fact that, or people were saying, oh, they, they don't care. Uh, but in fact, most of the students, and even the ones that are exhibiting some of the most egregious behavior, it's not because they don't care. Oftentimes, it's because they care a lot, mm -hmm. and they just don't have the supports to do that. And uh, we really feel, uh, feel very uh, strongly that part of what we do with restorative practices is the installation of hope, um, that things can be different. and. Um, through giving people an opportunity. Nobody's bad. Uh, right, right, and that people we can, make bad decisions. People make bad, dis bad decisions. But when a child is three years old and starts to build a wall to protect themselves, yeah. it takes some time to build that trust and break that wall yeah, down. Yeah, and it's not just because you come into the school and sit down in a chair that all of a sudden your behavior is going to be different. You know, I, I make the uh, little kind of rough comment. Of, you know, there are no jerks. There's just stories yet to be told. You know what I mean? <laughs> and we just, have, uh, we have one of our girls that. here that is just a precious child, precious child. She's like a junior in high school, sophomore or junior. And we was doing a debriefing like what you just described. We've got five minutes. What, we just, what you just described, mm -hmm. what have you learned? What, what's been the high point? What's the low point? What can we do to help you? And we was doing that kind of thing in a sort of a celebrating graduation type setting and mm -hmm. in a circle, and just like right down the numbers. There you go. And so she said something about her teacher said, some days I don't learn anything because a lot of our children use the term visit school. They go to school to visit. They don't go to school to learn. It's wow. a safe place. The government says they have to go, but they're not going to learn because they've built a wall. You just described our children and when you were talking about Absolutely. they need restorative practices to be loved broadly, and that's what we're working with them on. Mm -hmm. This child said, if the teacher comes in my room in the morning and comes in with an attitude, I'm not learning anything all day long. No. No. And I said, wait a minute, you're telling me the first teacher walks in your room and then you just don't, go, I'm not learning anything all day long. That's right. And, uh, and I thought it was so refreshing. This child has built a wall around herself to protect herself. Mm -hmm so that she won't be hurt. Right. But she was willing to share it with this peer group here <laughs> and say, this is what I'm doing, which I had, a, I took a lot of confidence, you know, that mm -hmm. she's willing to share it. This girl's going to make it. This yep. girl's going to make it, if she can stay in that circle. She can stay, yeah. And, and, it's, and it's so true, um, you know, educators in the past, it's like reading, writing, and arithmetic, yeah. and that's all I have to do, and that's just not what education is anymore. Um, students come in looking at the at the adult in the room, and if they're in a bad mood, the walls go up. Why? Because quickly. they're because quickly. Why? Because they're bad kids. No, because that's how they've learned. They don't want to be hurt, and, and right. it is it, it it actually makes sense coming from that student's perspective, it and does. coming from their background. It's in a sense, it's the right thing to do. Protect yourself. 
but and what your we're, little brothers and sisters you right, protect. and all of that. And what we're saying to the educators is you have a responsibility to continue to educate. So how are you going to build such a relationship in an environment in the school where they can drop those walls so they can be real? You ha you, to learning, you have to be in a state of vulnerability to be able to learn. You have to admit there's something that you need to learn. You need to take in. That's right. And if Circles you don't feel safe enough to do that. Circles than anything with inner city children. Oh, absolutely. Sitting in, well, even with middle class children, sitting in a circle. Yep. Fun, enjoyable, yep. humor, but becoming vulnerable, taking in information yep. and encouragement. You, you, you use restorative practices. You just haven't called it that. We're just being really explicit. I will about try to exactly learn how to spell it after about. I get off <laughs> <laughs> We can help you with that. <laughs> um, we got about three minutes. Okay. Help me. Tell, tell us. Tell okay. us what we need to know. So, about. so the installation of hope, you know, was one thing, and that uh, that it really does fall down to the educators. It comes down to how are we going to do this? How are we going to engage with kids in a way that's that's going to make a difference? Um, and you know, if you want to learn more about restorative practices, um, our website iirp.edu. Um, is our, our, our graduate school website and a phone number there, 610-807-9221. And again, we're the International Institute for Restorative Practices, so please visit the website. And then also the explicit work that we do with schools is called Safer, Saner Schools. Okay. And we have a website there, safersanerschools.org. If a school wanted to, if a private school wanted to bring you in, could your, your institute send somebody or yourself or someone come in oh, and absolutely. do training? Oh, absolutely. That's what I do. So I travel around, and there's a, a team of us that do that. Um, and that's my, I was going to say sole job. That's not exactly accurate, but that's a lot of what I do is I travel around and provide these professional Could churches elements. contract you, come in? Uh, and I, what I tell you, that's really important for me, like individually. Uh, you know, what, what drives me personally is, is, you know, my faith and wanting to do, uh, you know, a lot of this work. So I have a personal like passion. Churches myself that's out in urban out on the streets, out in the community. Yes, uh, we with as an organization would love to work with that and certainly, and me individually, personally, I have, I have a passion to want to be able to do that work with churches um, and connect uh, connect with them down the road, absolutely. Uh, we've got one minute to go. Are you going to be back in Nashville anytime soon as yes. you come back and be on the show? Yes, we do, um, we do four day events and we're doing like the first one uh, this week and there's another two um, that are going to be coming up that we're, we're really looking forward to doing here in Nashville. My secretary is one so she came to your event and she told me, and she's good. She knows her stuff. <laughs> and she, she told me, she said, well, you need to get him over here. And so okay. I really, Steve, I appreciate you coming. Absolutely. I'm looking forward Thank to you. Will you come back and be with us? I'd when love you come to. Back down? I'd love to. Okay. Absolutely. I'd like to get you back on in and talk some more because next time I'll know a little bit more about where you go. <laughs> but uh, you're, you're, that's good. I think you're right on target. Absolutely. I think so. Our yeah. country needs it. Absolutely. Mamas, Thank you. We've got to love our children. We've got to, just what Steve said, we've got to sit down and listen to our children. And they're our children, they're special, and we got to let them know they're special. Thank you for tuning in. Look forward to visiting with you again. Trouble sometimes I hear feeling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we are dear now is that stay. Humble your to God, save from the trash and the wrong. Seek the way pilgrims try, Christians away. My Jesus is Jesus coming soon. Morning or night, night or noon. noon. Many will be will there. Their doom. Trumpets will Trumpets sound. Will soon and sound. And all of the all dead the church shall rise. Righteous me in the sky. sky. Go and win. Go and win. Go and die. Seven word bound. Well, troubles will soon be your happy, happy forever. forever more. When we meet on that shore, free from all care. From all care. Rising up, Rising up in, in the, the skies, telling this world goodbye.